Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to a week of Linux and security news for the 22nd of October 2017. Well Ubuntu 17.10 was released this week and I uh, take a look at four of the distributions so far, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Mate, Kubuntu and Ubuntu Budgie. Well a few words about each of them, so Ubuntu 17.10, well Canonical have tried recreating the Unity desktop within the GNOME desktop, this is GNOME 3.26, by taking the fork of dash to dock and removing some of the features, for some reason, don't know. Yeah, it looked relatively like it, but you had the application launcher at the bottom of the screen rather than top. That to me was the biggest put off about the distro. Other than that, yeah, the theming and style did look you know, relatively similar to Unity. Functionality, no, it did not. However, Ubuntu Mate have implemented an excellent alternative to Unity with their desktop Mutiny. They have a style changer to replicate a few different desktops from GNOME Classic to a Mac OS. Pantheon and Unity. Yes, yeah, so they've implemented a global menu and heads up display. Both functional in the GTK and Qt applications. Excellent work from them. The Mate desktop is nice and lightweight. Not so sure about the theming, but you know what, it's reasonable, but I can imagine that not everyone will like it. Kubuntu is a bit of a challenge to review because how many times can I review the Plasma 5.10 desktop? Uh, quite a few it seems like I've done, so yeah, try and do something fresh on that for the umpteenth time. I hope it was slightly different than a standard review, and that I did and I did put across many of the features of the distribution. Yeah, it's KDE, it worked very well. Plasma has gone from strength to strength as time has gone on through version 5. So yeah, I've been happy with it, and I've only just recently upgraded to Plasma 5.11 in KDE Neon. It's a shame Kubuntu 17.10 did miss out on that upgrade, but unfortunately they were stuck on Canonical's timelines and could not have implemented the desktop in time. However, they are working on the Backports repository so you can get the Plasma 5.11 desktop in the future, or I should say, very near future. Ubuntu Budgie did seem a bit dull this time around. Um, yeah, it looked so similar to the previous releases, I should say previous two releases because that's all there's been. It seems that Solus with the Budgie desktop looked a whole lot better. And I, but I did go for a similar theming to Solus to replicate that improvement. So with a theme change, I think Budgie did look a bit better. But I suppose don't expect too many advancements this time around with Ubuntu Budgie because they're still working on the cute version of the desktop. So this was a jump from, I think it was 10.2 to 10.4. So not a huge change there, but yeah, it worked. Now onto some security news, the crack attack. Uh, unfortunately this hit a bad time for me because I would have liked to have done a full length video on this, but unfortunately I was swamped with the 17.10 reviews. So yeah, the crack attack is a vulnerability client side for WPA2 Wi-Fi networks. That is basically the modern day standard for Wi-Fi networks. This paper was written by two Belgian researchers back in May, and a few things have actually changed since the original release. They found that some attacks can be done easier. But yeah, it's all operating systems are vulnerable. Although the updates for Linux did come out this week, so yeah, they're no longer vulnerable. And I don't think many or any routers have to be updated, which is fortunate really, because uh, yeah, firmware updates on routers seem to be almost impossible to find. The research is built upon previous explorations of the weaknesses in WPA2 component protocols, and some of the attacks mentioned in the paper were previously acknowledged to be theoretically possible. However, the authors have turned these vulnerabilities into proof of concept code, and found that every Wi-Fi device is vulnerable to some variant of the attack. Notably, the attack is exceptionally devastating against Android version 6. Great, that's entirely unsupported nowadays. It forces the client into using a predictable all-zero encryption key. While Windows and iOS devices are immune to one flavour of the attack, they are susceptible to others, and all major operating systems are vulnerable to at least one form of crack attack. And in an addendum posted today, the researchers noted that things are worse than they appeared at the time the paper was written. Although the paper is made public now, it was submitted for review on the 19th of May 2017. After this, one minor change was made, as a result, the findings of the paper are already several months old. In the meantime, we've found easier techniques to carry out a key reinstallation attack against the four-way handshake. With our novel attack technique, it is now trivial to exploit implementations 
that only accept encrypted retransmissions of message free of the four-way handshake. In particular, this means that attacking macOS and OpenBSD is significantly easier than discussed in the paper. Android 6, Chromium and Android Wear 2 devices are particularly vulnerable to the four-way handshake attacks. An attack actually causes the protocol to reinstall a predictable all-zero key, making it trivial to decrypt the network's traffic. The same is true of Linux implementations that use 2.4-2.5 of the WPA supplicant. The Wi-Fi client commonly used on all Linux WPA supplicant is in the most recent version is 2.6. And as I mentioned, an update came out this week to fix this vulnerability. For WPA2 systems using the Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, TKIP, the message integrity code can be recovered by the attacker. This allows them to replay captured packets to the network. They can also forge and transmit new packets to the target's client posing as the access point. For devices that use the GLaOS Counter Mode Protocol, GCMP, the attack is the worst. It is possible to replay and decrypt packets. Additionally, it's possible to recover the authentication key, which GCMP is used to protect both communication direction as client or access point. Therefore, unlike with TKIP, an adversary can forge packets in both directions. That means the attacker can essentially join the network and pretend to be the client or the access point, depending on the type of access they want. Given that GCMP is expected to be adopted at high rates in the next few years under the YGIG name, this is a worrying situation that the research has noted. Yeah, so for the attack to actually take place, it has to be within range of your Wi-Fi, and changing the password will do absolutely nothing to stop it. So yeah, it's just a client-side attack, and do your updates when they appear. There was an upgrade to the KDE Plasma 5.11 desktop, so now up to version 5.11.1. A few little bug fixes in it, and the particular one that I noticed was fixed an issue that caused pinning applications in the task manager to erroneously shift around. Excellent, because that was slightly annoying for me, so I had to put up with that bug for a few days before the update came out. Well, I was a little bit slow at uh, installing Plasma 5.11, but yeah, now it's fixed. There's no problems. So here's just a few minor bug fixes. From Softpedia, VirtualBox 5.2 debuts officially with support for exporting VMs to Oracle Cloud. Unattended guest installation support is now available. So VirtualBox 5.2 is a massive update bringing revamped and modern graphical user interface based on recent Qt 5 technologies, as well as powerful new features that will help you with your virtualization tasks. One of these features is the ability to finally export and store virtual machines into the cloud. I'll be interested to know what size of virtual machine you can export. I'm presuming there is a limit. You can't just upload terabytes into the cloud. Not with a free service, of course. Mm, who knows? I'll have to check that out. Oracle has made it possible to support VMs to its Oracle Cloud OPC public cloud service, allowing users to easily deploy virtual machines across multiple VirtualBox installations. Imagine you no longer have to export VMs to external hard drives and import it to another computer. Just download it from the Oracle Cloud. Another interesting feature implemented in VirtualBox 5.2 is the support for unattended guest installations, which is similar to the easy install feature found on commercial VMware Workstation 6.5 and 7 virtualization software. Also, there's some experimental audio support for built-in video recording functionality. Well, that certainly sounds interesting, and I'll be trying that out very soon. From the register, Samsung to let proper Linux distros run on the Galaxy Smart Mobs. Samsung has announced it will soon be possible to run actual proper Linux on its Note 8, Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus smartphones, and even Linux desktops. So Samsung said it's working on an app called Linux on Galaxy that will let users run their preferred Linux distribution on their smartphone, utilising the same Linux kernel that powers the Android OS. Whenever they need to use a function that is not available on the smartphone OS, users can simply switch to the app and run any program that they need to in a Linux OS environment. The app also allows multiple OSs to run on a device. Well, that is actually quite a surprise and maybe a unique selling point for Samsung. There's no word on when Linux on Galaxy will debut. Samsung describes it as still a work in progress and offers an email notification service if you would like to know more. There's an article from Troy Hunt, what would it look like if we put warnings on IoT devices like we do cigarette packets? So yeah, that's an example of uh, cigarette packet warning. I'm assuming these are the warnings from Australia, but yeah, we've got similar warnings in the UK. 
So you assume full responsibility, warning, you acknowledge and agree that any information you send or receive during the use of the device may not be secure and may be intercepted or later acquired by unauthorized parties. You acknowledge and agree your child's intimate voice recordings may be placed on an unsecured Amazon S3 bucket and the MongoDB behind the app may be publicly facing without a password. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> say it as it is. An automatic pet feeder for cats and dogs, you acknowledge and agree that your survival of Fido or Fluffy is directly dependent on the reliability of your home internet connection and the availability of our online services. <laughs> oh, well, that's harsh, isn't it, if it goes wrong? Car ownership is a real thing. You acknowledge and agree that the API key used to remotely control the features of your vehicle may be printed in the windscreen of your car for all to see. But yeah, other than that, no reservations. <laughs> For a dishwasher, you acknowledge and agree you're responsible for maintaining the web server running in your dishwasher, including any patching remotely exploitable vulnerabilities. <laughs> yeah, get them on patchy devices. And for a smartphone, you acknowledge and agree that the default pin of four zeros is sufficiently secure that attacks of a backdoor nature may occur while using the device. <laughs> yeah, of course they will. Um, okay, just read that one. <laughs> Yeah, that is a fair point. Put warnings on IoT devices that are utterly useless on security. Hmm. And for you terminal enthusiasts, you can now play Rubik's Cube Puzzle in the terminal. I'm sure this is just what you want. N Rubik, N Curses based virtual Rubik's Cube. So there's a guide on installation from OS Technics, but let's just take a look at the picture. N Rubik. Um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> good luck with that. And for this week's stupid news, well, it's more of a humorous article from the register, really. Hate to break it to you, but billions of people can see Uranus tonight. Some may even glimpse the ring. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Uranus was particularly visible on Thursday and Friday, but in uh, register fashion, there were some rather humorous paragraphs. Uranus is instantly recognisable thanks to its blue-green nature, which is the result of methane in Uranus tinting the atmosphere. I bet it is. <laughs> Sadly, you won't be able to see Uranus's rings unless you're using a powerful telescope. Yep. And most moon watchers will be able to spot Uranus on that night, since it's relatively close to our closest planetary companion. Amateur enthusiasts should be happy to help you take a good look at Uranus as part of the festivities. Well, we have to look forward until 2620 for Uranus to be renamed Eurectum and stop all these jokes once and for all. Well, that's a week of Linux and security news. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.